Thank you everybody for hanging around at uh, end of the day. I'm sure you're all now slightly overwhelmed with information and tired and wanting to sneak off for that first beer. Um, but before you do that, let's have a little bit of fun and let's see if we can't offer you a unique opportunity in the form of one and possible two weeks aboard our research vessel. So, what is Great Barrier Reef Legacy? Well, Great Barrier Reef Legacy is a non-profit organisation with Australian and US tax deductible status, which makes us very attractive to our corporate and our private sponsors, which is a good thing. We are a team of passionate experts. We all live in Port Douglas and Cairns. Uh, we live and breathe the Great Barrier Reef every day. Uh, we're scientists, we're media uh, professionals, we're tourism and vessel operators, we're divers, we're engineers and we're educators and we are extremely passionate about our reef. We've watched it uh, slowly demise in our area and we think we know uh, a little plan I guess to uh, help uh, the, the reef in its toughest time. So. Um, while Great Barrier Reef Legacy has only been publicly visible for the last three or so years, we've been working on this uh, foundation of our organisation for the last 23 years. We used to run a research vessel called the Undersea Explorer, and in that time we have run over 700 reef expeditions. Uh, covering things like research, uh, so we've supported research from AIMS, for instance, doing their long-term uh, water quality testing to uh, Mickey Whale research, shark research and tagging, uh, rain island turtles. We've been involved in many, many projects over the years, even the early uh, mass bleaching surveys up in the northern section. So, and that's because we were out there 42 weeks a year. So we know the reef very, very well. We also know education very well. And over the years, we have uh, had thousands of university and high school students come through our doors and we take them out to sea. And, and we're very, very passionate about education as well. And then there's the media side of things. Uh, we have been involved in just about every major reef documentary in the last 20 years on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, we've also been uh, very instrumental in working with news media outlets and our partner project um, organisations uh, in getting the media right because there's a lot of misinformation out there so we, we're very key on that. But what do we actually do? Well, we fund, coordinate and execute collaborative research expeditions and we do that for three very important reasons. The first is to provide essential and crucial access for researchers and innovators and that's because it's very, very expensive to get out to the Great Barrier Reef. There are very few uh, research vessel options for the scientists and innovators out there and it costs a lot of money so we're overcoming this hurdle by using creative funding to get those people out there for free or in the most cost effective way because it's really the researchers that need to be out there as often as possible to understand what's going on in the natural system so we can start to overcome some of those barriers. We also provide access for educators, students and interns because we know that the next generation of reef champions needs to be nurtured and the best way to do that is to have them on board with the best marine scientists on the planet rubbing shoulders so they can learn the lessons that we've learned long and hard very quickly and on top of that we have an education program that's immersive and interactive so we're now communicating with students all around the globe so education is a huge thing for us. And of course there's our community education through our multimedia program. So we have an onboard multimedia team delivering everything that's happening on our research vessel on a daily basis to a global audience. And that's extremely important because if you're going to have a global community response to this now global problem of climate change and of course uh, the demise of coral reefs worldwide, then we need to act as one. And to do that we need to communicate very effectively and that's what we're trying to do through our research expeditions. So, how do we fund this? Uh, we have a major financial sponsor, the Northern Escape Collection. Now this is a tourism collective that has the Daintree Eco Lodge, the Flying Fish, which is our lovely research vessel for the moment, um, and the Orpheus Island Resort. So this is a tourism operator that understands you need to have a very healthy reef system if you're going to have a healthy tourism operation. And so they've invested very heavily in us because we in turn invest in a lot of other projects. So we support many research, education and multimedia projects. And that's a really uh, good relationship that we've got with those guys. 
We also have uh, small business champions in Australia and now in New Zealand that regularly donate small amounts of money each and every week. And that's really important to keep us uh, moving as quick as we can. We're also very, very lucky to have in-kind support from companies all over the globe, major companies, who supply us with their services, with their products and their expertise to make sure that when our research boat goes out, it's, it's uh, equipped with the latest in technology and uh, executed in the highest possible manner. And so we couldn't do it without those guys as well. From day one, our number one uh, ethos has been really collaboration and so we've opened our arms and we've opened our doors to all other organisations out there and that's because now more than ever we need to act as one. We need to be unified and we need to tackle this problem together and so collaboration is a huge thing for us and uh, we pride ourselves on having lots and lots of different partners so uh, if you're a partner that wants to collaborate please get in touch. And all this allows us to support researchers and scientists from government and non-government organisations. And what they need to do is be out on the reef as often as possible. And that's because the reef has lessons we need to learn. The natural system can show us what's working and what's not. It has the ability to rehabilitate itself with a little nudge here and there. But unless we're out there as often as we can, we're not going to understand how that's going to take place. So supporting these guys in getting out there as often as they can is a huge, hugely significant thing in what we're trying to do. So we put this model into action. In uh, November 2017, we raised $160,000 through our major sponsor. They gave us that very nice looking uh, white boat. It's a luxury tourism vessel that we adapted into a research vessel. Not ideal, but we made it work. Um, and we sent that vessel into the far northern region for 21 days, offering 10 teams of researchers free access for that entire time. So that's researchers ranging from Dr. Charlie and Verin, the godfather of coral, right down to our own uh, Great Barrier Reef legacy interns, who were able to rub shoulders with these amazing other scientists. We had Ames out there, University of Queensland, University of Technology Sydney, University of Sunshine Coast. We had individual um, organisations with Tony Ayling and, uh, and Charlie. So we had this amazing team that were the best in the business at looking at how reefs were responding to bleaching events. So what we really wanted to do was provide an overall reef health analysis. What had happened in the far north? We knew that aerial surveys had showed us, yes, it was really affected. But underwater, we weren't sure as to where the corals had survived, why they had survived, and, and which ones survived. And that was a really important bit of information that we were missing. So that's why we sent our ship into the far north. And of course, on top of all this, we wanted to really ramp up our education and our communication, and so we did daily updates direct from the researchers, direct from the reef. And that was a really interesting scenario because what was happening is that the scientists were asked to collaborate. That was a condition of travel. To come on our boat, you must share your data with each other and with scientists all around the world. And you can address your little piece of the puzzle to try to solve the, the bleaching issue. So those scientists working on the same reef on the same day. Uh, which is a, a revolutionary approach because usually scientists don't get to do that. They can only charter boats for one or two days, sneak out to a site and come back. This time we put all the scientists together and sent them out for 21 days and the results were fantastic. So, over that 21 days we covered... Oh, really? Yes. Holy crap! <laughs> That's not fair. Three minutes? Holy Jesus. You guys are in trouble. You owe me a beer. <laughs> All right, well, we've got 12 reef sites uh, up and down the coast. Uh, we travelled from Port Douglas all the way to Cape York and back. We did a hell of a lot of work. We hit 12 sites. Right, I'll move on. Um, most of the sites, unfortunately, looked like this in the mid and inshore reefs, okay? So they were heavily damaged. Um, and it's what we, in a way, expected, uh, but didn't want to find, but it's what we saw. Outer reef sites tended to do a hell of a lot better, okay? They were regularly flush with deep oceanic water and they uh, tended to fare better than the inshore sites, but there was bleaching and uh, coral mortality present there. We had the Ames team look at the, uh, the first definitive super coral species, the one that deals best with heat stress, Acropora tenuis. No matter where we went, no matter how many dead corals there were, this one survived. This one is or has something that the others don't. 12 live coral colonies were sent back to the Australian Institute of Marine Science. We heard from those projects in the other room in the earlier session, and they did amazing things with those colonies. Um, the University of Technology Sydney team transformed a uh, state, state room marble bathroom into a wet lab. 
uh, and they looked at the biological, biological and physiological traits of corals uh, that were surviving. So what did they have that other corals didn't? We had mapping teams. We had 30.8 kilometres of underwater reef mapped for the very first time and our aerial drone operator uh, surveyed and, and mapped 12 square kilometres of reef and now we have a baseline of what those reefs look like for going back into the future. So that was a, another world first. A green turtle sap tag. These guys are, are responding very differently to climate change and warming water. Uh, so we need to understand what's happening with those species and we sent the ROV down to 80 metres plus to work out what was happening on uh, deep reef systems. Tony Ayling recorded four new fish species for the Great Barrier Reef, very exciting. We collected 385 water samples for the Museum of Victoria and we conducted 24 citizen science surveys for Coral Watch, Mangrove Watch and Eye on the Reef and all of these were done for the first time ever in that region. So we were bloody busy. <laughs> but the big find was the most diverse branching coral site ever discovered on the Great Barrier Reef in that most hard hit region of coral bleaching from 2016 and 2017. And that was a very exciting find. Dr. Charlie Varon got out of the water, he was ecstatic. On top of that, he found one, if not three, new coral species. So that hasn't been done in 30 years. So you can imagine, if you know Charlie, he was, he was extremely excited about that. And the media went nuts over this. This is good news stories for the Great Barrier Reef. This is what we need to give people hope that these are the nursery sites that will help the rest of that region rehabilitate. Um, if you've seen Chasing Coral, you'll know that these guys are the best in the business at communicating with a global audience what's happening with coral bleaching right now. And so they sent their star, Zach Rago, to head up our education team and he had links with schools in Australia and the US on a regular basis while on the boat. And we also had our own legacy interns. Did we do some media? Yes, we did. 132 direct multimedia updates from the ship. Uh, on a daily basis through our own satellite. We also took our own satellite dish and we took an ABC correspondent and we did 96 TV, radio and print media outputs on the expedition itself. So you can see how much information was generated during this. We also held a free live public symposium for 150 people in Port Douglas which streamed live to 1500 people on Facebook. In total, when you calculated our entire social media reach across all platforms, across all our project partners, our uh, in-kind supporters, our government and non-government institutions, we had a reach of more than 5 million people. So when you're talking about engaging with a community, that's not the scientific community, but now a global audience, we were doing this in spades. So what next? Great Barrier Reef Legacy is working hard to ensure that we can uh, get the support and funding we need to have our own dedicated research vessel. So we can send that boat out there for 32 weeks a year and offer 320 research spaces, that's a week long each, uh, to get the researchers out there and doing what they need to do. 96 education spaces, 64 media and project partner spaces, and 64 passenger spaces. And we firmly believe that this is an absolute model and a catalyst for innovation, collaboration, and change. If we can get everyone working together on a vessel, uh, if we can communicate with a global audience on a regular basis, then everyone comes along for this journey and we can start to affect change. Great. That's not the end. <laughs> I've got something else to announce. <coughs> Sorry, I'm going to take another minute. Um, we're very excited to announce now our second research expedition will take place in October and November this year. We've managed to raise another $200,000. We're going to send our research ship up into the far north again, and we're having a worldwide call out for researchers, innovators, anyone who has a good project that needs vessel support <coughs> and access to the reef. Please get in contact with us. We have 12 positions available. Um, jump on our website. And uh, let's hope that you'll be coming out to sea in October. Thank you.